We need religion more than ever, and we need to get the political ideologists out of the way. So Rasta literally says, I am the shaman. He's the first shaman in history who becomes a priest. This is the only world religion that totally embraces psychedelics. And civilization as a concept was invented by Zoroaster. Nobody thought that we could improve on the world before he came along 3,700 years ago. This is the original philosophy, the philosophy of flux, the philosophy of the world where everything is changing all the time and we're active agents in a world of change. There's mm. the process fundamentally, but then we can as active human agents be co-creators with God in this world. This is the idea that Zoroastrians brought to the world. This got is it. before the Buddha. Yeah. This is where the Buddha got the idea of enlightenment from. The Magi, which is where magic comes from. This is Zoroastrian. All the shamanic traditions are built in this. Intention, ceremony, integration. The religion is about the practice towards perfecting the mind. How can we think the purest, the best, most constructive possible thoughts in the natural? Stay heroic no matter what. Because if you allow your heart to be full of bitterness and you become resentful towards the world, then you're no longer a Zoroastrian. And this is the choice you have to make every day. We could not handle secularization. It ended up like Nietzsche said he would. It ended up with the death of God. It ended up in complete and total nihilism. And that total nihilism is obvious today. It's called the meaning crisis in our circles. And here's the catch with Zoroastrianism, why it's going to be the third one coming out of Asia and why you might want to convert. <laughs>Zoroastrianism opened up to conversions in the West in the 1990s. And I was one of the first Westerners actually converted. I converted in 1992. And I'd studied Buddhism and Taoism intensely before that because I knew that as a philosopher in my generation, we couldn't start with the Greeks again. That was getting embarrassing. The <laughs> Greeks did not invent philosophy. They just right. picked up stuff from the East and basically got it together and threw it out there. The one thing the Greeks did invent was drama, not philosophy. Uh, philosophy is older. That's impressive, though. Yeah. And it's they also invented, oh, yeah. Bah! <laughs> I love that about the Greeks. Like, they got a little fuck in them, you know? Like, oh, bah! Of course they did. Of course they did. <laughs> you learned so. that too from these. <laughs> <laughs> you wait until you go to Persian dinner parties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the Greek fat weddings are nothing compared to them. <laughs> but anyway, I, I was offered to convert, and I studied Taoism and Buddhism. But I decided to go with Zoroastrianism. I was, I think I was alerted to the fact that we have to import these religious traditions to the West. Mm -hmm. We can give them technology, but we have, we have to import philosophy from the East. So I studied all these religions thoroughly. I learned the languages. I studied Mandarin, Sanskrit, Avesta to understand it and discovered there was an Indian tradition, which we now call Buddhism over here. There's a Chinese tradition, which we call Taoism, which is also fantastic to take from. Mm -hmm. But there's also a Persian tradition, which is Zoroastrianism. Mm -hmm. And I converted in 1992. Now there are thousands of Westerners who are converted. I know several people here in Texas are converted. Mm. Um, and of course, also, so Rastans have come from Iran and India. They got out of the mullah hellhole that's called Iran today uh, and came here to America and became this really successful little ethnic minority. The only ethnic minority in America that's a higher average income and higher average education than the Jews are the Zoroastrians from Iran. <laughs> Interesting. And it took them 30 years to get there. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's a fantastic community. They also run India, by the way. So I was sort of, you know, married into the elite of India, the Tata family, they're all Zoroastrians. So, so um, I was very excited about it. It was an important decision for me personally to make, but now there are thousands have done it. And I think we already have this massive Buddhist thing going on in the West. We have 600 temples and monasteries for Buddhism. Women have taken to Buddhism intensely. They leave Christianity now in droves in America and Europe, and they're becoming Buddhists. Mm -hmm. And I think men are following. I also expect us to have a large Taoist um, revolution going on here because we have so many Chinese in exile who left communist China. America's full of them. They're taking Taoism with them, mm -hmm. which is their open and free religion. 
Yeah. And I think with all the Iranians that have arrived in Europe and America, so Rastians is also going to have a go at this. Yeah. Why? 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 Why you? Why Zoroastrianism? Why is it important? And how does it play out as we look at the world right now? I think because it doesn't do the afterlife story. I think the problem with Christianity and Islam is that they're both dualist religions and they're totally based on the fact that there should be an afterlife and therefore these religion build large pyramids or mm -hmm. graveyards, cemeteries, right? Mm -hmm. In Zoroastrianism, you take the dead body out into nature and you give it to the vultures or the coyotes or whatever. You give it back to nature because it's just a corpse. You mm -hmm. learn that when you die, you die. This is what you learn in Buddhism. This is what you learn in Taoism, in Zoroastrianism. And this is what we believe today. And therefore, these religions are the ones that are credible, that we have on the world map that we can pursue today. Mm -hmm. So I, I suggest, but the people who live in my tantric monastery in Scandinavia study all three, but I recommend them all after a couple of years to choose one and convert to it and go fully into it. Mm -hmm. When you're saying that when you die, you die, you're not talking about the non-existence of the continuity of consciousness or reincarnation no, no. or the soul. I'm, I'm pro reincarnation. Right. But what reincarnates are the archetypes. It's right. not you and your memory For necessarily, sure. but the person that I am, the person that you are, you are a certain archetype and that's where you contribute to the society you live in. And that's a timeless quality within you. I have an archetype that I, where I contribute and they're kind of similar because they're both kind of shamanic, both you and I. <laughs> but you know, the, this, this, is, uh, this I think is fundamentally what I call archetypology. And the archetypes are reincarnated. This is the trick to understand that's how the world works. But Egypt was ruined during the Bronze Age building pyramids. Finally, like 99% of the national budget of Egypt went to building pyramids and it was ruined, destroyed, and never returned to its form. We never had Egypt return to form after the Bronze Age. And I think that taught us the lesson that Islam and Christianity are insufficient towards the kind of spirituality we're looking for now. And here's the catch with Zoroastrianism, why it's gonna be the third one coming out of Asia and why you might wanna convert. <laughs> this is the only world religion that totally embraces psychedelics. And how so? It's called the Haoma. The Haoma. Yeah. If you look at the world map and don't think of anything else, but just think of where the psychedelic super plants have been located where you find like tons of different plants you could use for psychedelic experiences and for healing and everything, you find three spots on the world map that totally stand out. These are the three psychedelic superpowers on the world map, and they're Mexico, Peru, and Iran. Hmm. Now, I live in Europe, so Iran is the only one close to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm pursuing the Iranian uh, thread uh, to discover psychedelics. You can literally make ayahuasca out of ingredients you find only in Iran if you want to, even if ayahuasca, as we both know, is a brew coming out of the jungles of South So that America. would be Syrian rue Syrian mixed rue, with example. mimosa. Yeah. And that's how, you, yeah. that's how you would do it. So you'd basically get the DMT from the mimosa and the Syrian rue acts as the MAOI and you can brew that together. Russian archeologists in Afghanistan and Turkmenistan have discovered that sometimes you have up to nine different ingredients into these witches brews that these guys drank. So, and this was the halma you're saying is like a, a type of a certain type of ayahuasca. Is, is and the this theory. is the culture where the word shaman comes from. Shaman and, and is magic. literally a Mongolian word, but it's yeah. from the original Persian word, which is sautar. And if you read the Gotha Sorasar's own text, which is 3,700 years old, then he calls himself, I am the sautar. Sorasar literally says, I am the shaman. He's the yeah. shaman who's becoming the priest. He's the first shaman in history who becomes a priest. Essentially, a shaman who puts on a dress and walks into the village and returns to the community to serve the community. That's what a priest is. A priest is a shaman, archetypologically, who becomes a priest when we start to settle. Mm -hmm. So we start have human settlements in history. The priest uh, arrives, but that's the same. It's the same character. And so uh, Sorastor says that I am the Sautar. The Sautar is the Persian word for shaman. Yeah. So when we say shamanism, and we talk of Mexican Peruvian shamanism, the word written and it comes from Iran. But what's great here in the US, you living in Texas, is that you have these superpowers next door. You have Mexico and Peru, and you have all these plants, you have mm -hmm. all these traditions. And mm -hmm. This is why you and I both went to see Don Howard Lawler in, in the jungles in the Amazonas, because we wanted to learn the Peruvian traditions, and yeah. we have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's also the Magi, which is where magic comes from. This is Zoroastrian. Yes. Right? Like so, the, and they were they were. So what's the difference between a magi and a zautar? A magi is a practicing shaman in the sense that these are the guys who cook the brews and do the services, and you go to see them on on a personal basis for consultations. But the zautar is a social role. 
The Sautar, so it's a master. Can, it's a master, master of the monk, but he's not he's necessarily the, Sautar, yeah. the shaman that's serving. Exactly. And in, in, in the modern context, we have mobeds today. But if you're a moped in the Sarastian community, that means you're like the local priest to go to for counseling who marries people when they get married. You know. So it's more, like it's that. about your function. Yes. Yeah, so the different way. functions within the priesthood. Let's yeah. put it that way. We would probably call a magi. Magi is more like a monk today. Uh -huh. And and we would then say the Sautar is more like the priest. Uh huh. Or the shaman. Um, all right. So starting to starting to understand this a little bit, let's zoom out a little bit and say, you know, because I just read the Sacred Gathas of Zarathustra, a translation by Pablo Vasquez, and I found it, you know, I didn't agree with a hundred percent of the things he said, but there were some really remarkable, beautiful insights that were like, wow. You know, he was definitely tapped in and I appreciated Zarathustra's humility, you know, in the way that he's asked. He's asking questions that sometimes he can't answer. It's almost like he's in a channeled conversation with the divine. He's working towards enlightenment. He's, he's working this on it. This is before it. the Buddha. Yeah. This is where the Buddha got the idea of enlightenment from. Mm -hmm. That's why these religions are so closely interconnected. So... What I do as a Zoroastrian every morning as I get up and meditate, but my meditation is more like a contemplation. And this is where the good versus evil thing comes in. It's really about constructive versus destructive mindset. It's not like good and evil is out there in the world. The world operates the way it does. That's called Asha. It was later imported by the Chinese and became the Tao in Taoism, which is exactly the same thing. In India, the same thing is called Artha, how the world works. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do when I meditate Which is, is that, polarity, right? So, yeah, yeah, it's polarity. Is only, I take in how the world works. Right. I adjust my life to how the world works. They call it to, to have a scientific worldview. Like, why, why would I not find out what is a lie and what is true about the world the first thing I do? So I try to do that. And then I sit down with my own subjectivity, my own personality, and look at what am I doing in my life at the moment? Mm -hmm. And what are constructive feedback loops in my life? And what are actually destructive feedback loops in my life? For example, you're married. The question then towards your wife would be when you contemplate, does she expand in your presence or mm -hmm. is she actually shrinking with you having her around her at the moment? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what you should do in a relationship. Just say that I want you to expand. Yeah. I want you, I want to be constructive about your personal expansion. That is what Zoroastrianism is. That's all we do. I mean, we don't that, have that those right, 10 commandments right there, because everything that right there comes is a, from that. That right there is a revolution in relationship. If you every morning woke up to say, how much can my presence expand my partner today. I like when you say that. You know, like You're how, mu how much? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like how much yeah. can I expand my partner? Bring her or him into the fullest expression of who they are. And if you both did that as your morning practice, fuck, come on, yes. man! Like you guys, you, you see where the relationship is not working, right? And it might be some third force involved or something else irritating your relationship, but you both, if any one of you shrinks within the relationship, you got to find out where is that shrinkage coming from? We should not shrink. We should expand until we die. <laughs> Let's you know? go. And the way, the way you describe that expansion until death, like if you lived a full whole life, you're lucky. Mm -hmm. That's called Harvatat in ancient Persian. It's the ultimate form of bliss to have lived a full life and be ready to die and said, I've lived a full life. I've done everything I could ever do. I was the lucky one. I had a full, rich life, and I'm now ready to leave life. Let's leave life as, as a person. No, it's not an archetype. I leave life called Harvata. Then the other thing that comes in is Ameritat, which is immortality. What survives is then the memory of you. Mm -hmm. So instead of going to a cemetery to find a grave of somebody who died, I pass the corpse on to nature, return it to nature, and I remember that person on the day they died every year for the next 70 years. Mm. We do that tradition as we're asking, it's called the Polgasar. The Polgasar celebration, remember somebody in the community who really meant a lot for wow. you, could be your own parents, and you remember them the day they died for the next 70 years, every day of the year, that day of the year. That's mm -hmm. their Polgasar day. So this is how we celebrate people instead of building huge cemeteries full of millions of people waiting for the return of Christ or whatever. Mm -hmm. We return their bodies to nature. We keep the memory going on them and we know their archetype will be reborn. Mm -hmm. There will be another person coming back, another man, another woman coming back to represent what they contributed to the next community. Yeah.
through my own psychonautic exploration, I have a slightly different cosmology, but I still recognize the beauty of that. I feel like there's an oversoul that your personal soul then surrenders to. So like an oversoul, which manifests many different lives, but the oversoul is still unique and distinct in the force of greater capital L life. And I've made contact with, you know, with that oversoul. And I know that this, I'm just a temporary incarnation called Aubrey of an oversoul that seems eternally evolving. I totally agree. So asked the wood too. It's even two levels. There's the oversoul we call God, which unifies absolutely everything. Right. But below the oversoul called God are the lesser gods. And the lesser gods are the archetypes themselves. Mm -hmm. Catholicism eventually found out they had to include that in Catholicism. This is why they were the former Christianity had the saints. St. Michael, St. You, you go, to, You go to your archetype, like, okay, you're good at carpenting. You're going to be a carpenter one mm -hmm. day. Well, then you got a lesser god who's the carpenter. And, and this, is, this is what you have. So you have not only the oversoul, but actually you have the different archetypes involved as well in your worldview. And then you represent that archetype as well as you possibly can during your life. That's yep. what we call Harvatat. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, it, it seems like the when I was reading, <clears throat> there's so many aspects that are so congruent with the psychonautic practices that have brought me to where I am, my own understanding of the cosmos. It's like, oh... Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think one of the, so there's two thoughts about evil. One, evil or bad, is simply the absence of good, right? Yes. It's simply the absence of good, but they don't actually give it any kind of autonomy or any kind of aggregate quality and intention. It's just the absence of. And that doesn't feel quite true. I've been in so many fucking journeys where there is a dark force that's coming in that is trying to fuck me up, 100%. You know, I've had to, I've had to square off and it's not something that like the new age people would say, oh, integrate your darkness and love it. Yes, yes, yes. On the highest level, love everything because that's the yin yang. That's the balance of the cosmos. Yes. Love it all. It was all created for us. The darkness serves the light. However, don't get it twisted in this incarnation right now. That being is just trying to fuck you up and it's actually your job to resist it. That means you are a Sorastian, not new age. <laughs> Because that's exactly yes. how I would define it. No, it is a struggle. Yeah. This is why I say to contemplation, I, I, I love meditation. I love Buddhism. I go to Buddhist monasteries all the time to just clean my head and do that absolute meditation towards that zero state that you're looking for. But I'm actually meditating in front of a rock when I'm doing it. That's how you practice Buddhism. When I meditate in Zoroastrianism, I meditate in front of a fire. Mm. The fire is alive. It's alive. It's, it's, it's a totally different experience. I am having the flux of life in front of me and I'm part of that flux and I'm an active agent within that flux. I have a responsibility to fight evil for good in the life that I do. But the way I describe it, not to get into some kind of childish Christian version of good and evil, we're not doing Harry Potter here. We're doing something way more profound. Is that I said the best way to translate Asha, which is to do the good, is that Asha is constructive mindset. Mm -hmm. How is your mindset constructive about your family, about your clan, your tribe, your community? How do you, how do you live up to the archetype you were given? How do you live up to the talent you have? Mm -hmm. How do you optimize that in the best way possible? Find people to collaborate with, to express that archetype the best way you possibly could? That is a daily journey you have to do every day. So I go over to Sorastian meditation, the Tasha Maino, which we call the Diana, and, and then I practice that as a contemplation, which is that what do I actively do in my life? How, how can I be constructive rather than destructive? And that's exactly, destructive is also shrinking. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the absence of the, the power to expand. Mm -hmm. Expansion is an active thing. It requires my agency and your agency for expansion to happen. No civilization will ever happen by itself. Yeah. It only happens because civilized human beings are devoted to to plant civilization up. And civilization as a concept was invented by Zoroaster. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought that we could improve on the world before he came along 3,700 years ago. Before that, everything was just recycling. Everything went round, round, round. Everything was the eternal return of the same until Zoroaster came along and thought the event. My latest book is called This Process and Event. There's mm -hmm. the process fundamentally in, in existence, but then we can as active human agents be co-creators with God in this world, and that is the event. Mm. And this is the idea that Zoroastrianism brought to the world. Is that there's a constant choice from the 
the Ash- the path of the Ashavans, right? Or the Druzhvans? Yeah, I, you become an Ashavan when you devote yourself to doing right. Asha. Right, so you, you, you can become an Ashavan devoted to the good or a Druzhvan, either unconsciously or consciously driven and devoted to the dark. Exactly. The way to describe that is that stay heroic no matter what. Mm-hmm. Because if you allow your, your heart to be full of bitterness and you become resentful towards the world, then you're no longer a Zoroastrian, you're no longer an Ashavan, you're a Druzhvan. And this is the choice you have to make every day. So the way you do it is called humata hukta urvashta. So humata is the contemplation itself. You think thoroughly through everything that's going on in your mind and you realize what is constructive as a feedback loop and what is destructive. You drop the destructive, you concentrate on the constructive, and you commit to it. When you commit to it, that's the second step. So mata hukta. Hukta is like swearing an oath. You swear an oath to your brothers or the community that I know now what is the Asha thing to do. And I swear, no, I'm going to be an Ashaman of my best ability to try to stay with the truth and plant truth into the world and build truth. That's what you do with the Hukta. The last one, the Rashta, is the practice itself. Mm-hmm. That's when you go out in the world and actually do what you're committed to. And then the next day, of course, you go through, did I succeed with the Rashta yesterday? Did I fulfill it? In some cases I did, in some cases I failed. Okay, then I drop the failures, I stay with the success and build the next day on that conviction. So you're literally meditating on feedback loops yeah. when you're a Zoroastrian. In, uh, so in the, in the tradition that I'm really deeply studying now, in the Kabbalist tradition, there's a concept called birur, the clarification of your desire. And the yes. idea is to clarify what it is that you want so that it's clarified so that your wants and the divine wants become ontically identical, right? Like you're actually doing, you say to God, God, what do you want? And God says, I don't know, what do you want? And you say, God, I don't know, what do you want? And then eventually you come and say, all right, we want the same thing. Yeah. And that would be an Ashavan at that point. Yes. So it, it's a similar concept. I know there was a lot of intermingling between, you know, the ancient oh, totally. Hebrews. I, I am a Sufi. Yeah. I'm not an Islamic Sufi. I don't pretend I'm Islamic, by the way, because Sufis aren't Islamic at all. That's why the rest right. of Islam hates the Sufis. But I am a Sufi, or as we now say jokingly, a Zufi with a Z. <laughs> a Zufi? I am a Sorastian Sufi. Yeah, it's a great word, isn't it? Sufi. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a Zufi, right? So, I mean, I am a practicing Sufi. That's exactly what I am. And the relationship between Sufism and Kabbalah is extremely fascinating. I even argue in the new book, in Protestant event, that this Persian Hebrew axis is the hope we have for Western culture. Otherwise, we have to import Buddhism and Taoism fully from the East, but we have the Persian Hebrew axis, which is precisely what you study now, is Sufism and Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. And this is from Zoroastrianism and Judaism. Christianity has to go back to Judaism and drop the afterlife idea. Islam has to drop the afterlife idea and go back to Zoroastrianism Mm because these are the roots of Islam and Christianity. And all recommended in the book is that if you're serious about being a Muslim and Christian and you want to have a credible religion you actually can believe in and practice, go back to the roots. Go back to the roots. Go back to the roots. And one of the things that I I noticed in here, and I, I don't have it marked so I can easily say, but there's an idea of the evolution of of God and the good as well is like that this is it's evolving as you're evolving so it's we're, like we're it's a constant, exactly yeah. so it's like a constant process which is also something i've you know learned through the through the kabbalah through like the mystical readings from gaffney like going deep in it's an evolving it's an evolving process and an evolving clarification of your desire and evolving in 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 zoroastrianism it seems like pu- they use purification in, as as the word for clarification but basically means what i take it to mean is there's Druzhvan and Ashavan forces working within us at all times because we're a mixture in this world of polarity. So you try to clarify, purify. Get the bitter out and stay heroic. Get the bitter no out what. and stay heroic. Yes. And don't allow the Druz, Druzhvanic forces to, to turn your head, Sitra Akra, which is another Kabbalist word, the turning of the face from God. Don't allow the Druzhvanic forces to turn your face from God, the good, the divine, and stay fucking heroic. It's the book of Job. It's the oldest book in the Old Testament. (laughs) And this is where the origin is. So the Persian Hebrew axis produced the concept of philosophy. As a Zoroastrian, I call my religion Masta Yasna. Masta Yasna means the love of wisdom. 
1,200 years after Sorostor, Heraclitus came to Greece. He was probably Kurd originally. Herac you should read Heraclitus' fragments and Sorostor's Gothas next to each other. They are so similar. Mm -hmm. This is the original philosophy, the philosophy of flux, the philosophy of the world where everything is changing all the time and we're active agents in a world of change. This is the original philosophy, long before Plato comes along with his ideas about eternal forms and things like that, because, mm -hmm. the, you know, I'm to totally against Plato. I'm, I'm pro Zoroaster <laughs> Heraclitus here. And so the Greeks hear about the concept of master yasna, that you can have a religion which is actually philosophy. Uh -huh. There's no difference. It's just that it's the real religion. It's the best religion you could have. It's the religion of civilization itself. So they take the word master yasna and translate it to Greek, which is philosophia. Mm -hmm. Philosophia, the love of wisdom. And what Zoroaster taught, which is really helpful to understand, is that he says there are two things you need to be concerned with. One of them is being itself. There is a world there. It exists. It's called Ahura, from Ahu, meaning being. Ahura. And the other aspect is the master, which is mind. What he does is that he does body and mind, but not as separate things. Mm -hmm. They're totally interconnected in Zoroastrianism. We are embodied as human beings. We have a mind and we have a body. We have mm -hmm. both. We're beings and we have mind at the same time. And then the religion is about the practice towards perfecting the mind. How could we think the purest, the best, most constructive possible thoughts and then act on them? Right. And you then discovered, of course, that this spread across Asia. This started about 1700 before Christ. It spread eastward towards China and Japan. It spread southward towards India. and these traditions then became what the Indians called dhyana, which is where all the yogas are, the practice of all the yogas. That's dhyana. In Persia, it's dhyana, D-A-E-N-A, -E which mm -hmm. is what I practice every day as a rest in the Persian dhyana. The word for that in Chinese is shan. The word for that in Vietnamese is thien. The word for the practice in Korean is siom. And the word for the practice in Japanese is zen. Mm. So when I came to Japan the first time in the 1980s to practice Zen. I stayed in the Zen monastery outside of Kyoto. I was invited by the monks to become a Zen monk. I was just shocked that sitting there in front of that, those rocks with that garden meditating was just like sitting at the fire temple in Yast in Iran meditating. Mm. And now finally the archeologists have discovered of course that the connections between Persia and Japan were intense over like 2000 years. The exchange of ideas was going on all the time. So these are just the spiritual schools of Asia that developed along the trade routes, and they're almost identical. Mm -hmm. I recommend people to pick one of them and convert to it if you want to. I mean, if you're doing the Kabbalah studies, you're going to Judaism, go for it. Mm -hmm. It's actually also part of what I call the Silk Road Triad. So, right, so right. that's a good choice. Yeah, and I love, I've just loved opening my mind to more of these Zoroastrian traditions because ultimately there's a, you know, there's beauty in all of the different faces and i think anybody should as any philosopher would and just look at all of them see which ones resonate and then potentially even create a hybrid like the way i feel is i want to hybridize as much of the best practices the best yogas the best mitzvahs the best the best dhyanas the best you know zen pra i want to integrate all of them and because we all kind of create our own religion anyways. You know, my, my friend Daniele Bellelli wrote a book, Create Your Own Religion. Basically, he was saying no two Christians are the same Christian. They worship a different aspect of the divine. They practice a slightly different way. Everybody's always making improvisations anyways. So might as well make an improvisation and then live that. But it, it, there is something to the traditions and the accountability and the community. So I understand also picking picking one lane or creating the codification and structure of your own lane and saying like, well, I'm my own thing, but this is, these are my practices. These are my yogas. This is how I worship, et cetera. One way or exactly. another. Exactly. I mean, if you share enough of the beliefs and practice of a community, join the community. Yeah. Why should you be alone? Religion, religion means connection. It, it, it really, means yeah. how you connect people to yeah. one another. Or the way I phrase it is that I say religion is for men and spirituality is for women. It's a bit of a little provocation, but there's something to it, actually, because women have started creating their own religion and have done so for the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. This whole import of Eastern spirituality to the West has been driven by women. And I appreciate that a lot. I, I'm working with men now spiritually. I'm focused on the men's movement in Scandinavia where I live. And we run a tantric monastery uh, for men where we fix men so they can go out in the world and get married and do the good shit that they should do, you know? Yeah. And 
we've been lacking that because of Protestantism in Scandinavia. We even threw the Catholic monasteries out of our culture 400 years ago. I think that was a terrible mistake. Monasteries are brilliant. The point with the monasteries, that's, that's the ultimate retreat center. That's where you go to fix yourself when you fucked it up in your life and you want to sort your things out. And especially if you're in a relationship with a woman, she goes off to her retreat center. She goes off to her monastery with women. Mm -hmm. You go off to monastery with men and you fix yourself and then you meet and you continue and you thrive in your marriage. Mm -hmm. This is what we need. We wow. need monasterial cultures. And I think people take to these ideas and what's happening now is that men are waking up to the reality that they have to create their own religion. Mm -hmm. Or rather, they have to pick a religion that actually they can believe in. This, yeah, that, I mean, that's... when I converted, the most important thing for me, I, I buy this shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is so true. me. I did the psychedelics before that. I, I had these loose ends in my life for different things. I was doing Buddhist meditation. I, I studied Taoism as a philosopher. I found it incredibly interesting. But when I discovered the Zoroastrian heritage, it was just like, it was much closer to home. It's, all, it's as much West as it is East. It's Persia. Mm. It is the connection between East and West. And I kind of knew when I became a philosopher um, that I would eventually pursue the connection between East and West and how we could really make that work. Mm. One of the things I noticed reading the, uh, reading the Gathas is the image of the cow and the image of the cow. And I think I understand it. It's Gaia. It's Gaia Sophia. It's fertility. It's the, it's the bountiful, plentiful, loving nature of the divine that will feed you mead and milk and, and nurture and care for you, right? Yes. Is, exactly. that, is that basically what it is? Because yes, there's yeah. deep, deep, deep reverence Zora for Gaia. Aster comes there. onto the scene 1700 before Christ. He's incredibly prophetic, way ahead of his time. And he and his best friend, Vishtaspa, established what we call the two-headed phallus. This is the beginning, actually, what leads all the way up to the U.S. Constitution. Eventually, the power must be split between different power centers. Otherwise, you get the tyrant. So Rasta tries to figure out, how do you avoid having a tyrant if you build an empire or a large community of people? How do you avoid having a tyrant? He's very concerned with that. And he and Vishtaspa set out to do that. And here, when you see what they did was that they actually took what we now call Hinduism and reformed it. This is only 200 years after the Indo-Iranians go separate ways. So south of the Hindu Kush, they go down into India and separate northern India, and they have then the Sanskrit language. And the north of the Hindu Kush, that's Iranian culture. And they speak a language called Avesta. When I learned Avesta, I learned Sanskrit first because they're so similar, the, the, the incredibly similar languages. It was you by can, learning Sanskrit can, that I could learn Avesta and start understanding the original scriptures in Persia. So you actually can read and or converse in Avestan? Yes, and Sanskrit. Amazing. Well, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> I'm supposed well, to do the let work. Me, let, me, let me just, do you, is there anything that you know in Avestan, just so I can hear... Because because I I just finished reading the Gathas read read them carefully and slowly and and found the mystical wisdom in there found what I resonated with found what I didn't understand it was beautiful it was a beautiful journey and I'm yes. like super grateful for it but I have no flavor for the for what the language sounds like do you know anything in a oh, yeah, yeah, that you could but recite the thing is that before I started writing about this and became a philosopher on these ideas. We already got used to that if you can't translate karma, you can't translate karma. It's such a rich word, you can't. So you just write it discursively. You just write karma instead of trying to translate it to English. And you do that with a lot of terminology from India and China. And I just thought, well, the best thing I could possibly do then is to take these Persian terms and I translate them. Yeah. So the terms are there, Asha, Druj, Harvatat, um, Ameritat. I mean, the Protestant event book, which is essentially a sort of contemporary Zoroastrian manifesto. Mm -hmm. it, it's sold as a bundle together with Pablo's excellent translation, by the way. So you can study both the original texts from Zoroaster and study what, what is a contemporary philosophical reinterpretation of Zoroasterism. And I keep the words as they are because once people tr start to translate these words, the translations, get they, they don't get it. Sure. It's so wrong. And the frustration when I learned the actual language and understood what Zoroaster meant when he used the Western language, then I realized, okay, this is what scholars of Indian and Chinese history be frustrated with. This is why they have refused to translate all the terminology of India and China. And instead, take, they've taken those ter that terminology over to Western culture, so we actually have to, to read the word in its original form. Yeah. Because it's a way of trying to avoid misunderstandings that get very serious with time. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things that I think really needs to be understood here is what I see Zarathustra saying is 
how he's pleading with the divine. How can we help convert the Druzhvins, right? He's not saying, how can we kill all the Druzhvins? Exactly. Right? And that's, I think, the shadow form that ultimately developed in jihadist fundamentalist mindset, also Christian fundamentalist mindset. So many religions are like, okay, that's the bad over there. There's the Druzhvin. They're all Druzhvin, 100%. Let's slay them because there's no redemption. That's the crazy thing about Christianity, right? It's all about redemption. And meanwhile, they're just killing people. Yes. Like, if you actually believed in redemption, you would stop fucking killing people. Well, hey, we have a problem with Islam. We got the mullahs, we got Islamic State, we got Hamas. Yeah. <laughs> they all come out of Islam. There's a problem there. So um, I think the most radical act that any human ever did was in Babylon 539 before Christ. When Cyrus the Great, who was a Zoroastrian from Persia, invaded Babylon and shocked the world. Until Cyrus the Great, 539 before Christ, if you invaded another country, you killed your enemy, and before you killed your enemy, you boiled their children in oil. A bit like Hamas in that was like That was like Moloch, right? That's October 7 in Israel. Yeah. So you got it right there. Um, what Cyrus the Great did was that he radically transformed how we looked at warfare. What he did was that he shocked the world. He didn't kill a single Babylonian. Instead, he stood in the marketplace in Babylon and yelled at the Babylonians for not being Babylonian enough. <laughs> you must be more Babylonian. Then he kissed the feet of the god Marduk. He kissed the feet of the Babylonians' own god as a foreign invader. Can you think of how radical that was at the time? Oh, sure. They he would, gave they would them cut the money. The off, he gave they, them the money and said, the heads build the a better temple for Marduk. Be better <laughs> Babylonians so you can defend yourself better next time so I don't have to fuck in the ass all over again. <laughs> and he then turned, he turned Babylon into his own capital and his own empire. And then he found these quirky, funny little guys in the streets of Babylon called Hebrews. And the Hebrews were apparently this Egyptian sect running around. They were trading already. They were doing banking already back then. Uh -huh. They were terrific. He loved them to bits <laughs> and told the Hebrews, what are you doing here? Well, we're actually supposed to build a temple in Jerusalem. We had a temple. It was ruined. Now we're over here doing trade. And he's like, no, no, no. You, go, you can stay here and trade as much as you like. Here's your money. He gave them like a huge budget and said, go back to Jerusalem and build the second temple. Because that's the Ashavanic path. Do good. Exactly. Do good with your life. Do good with and the Cyrus world. And Cyrus the Great, until this day, is the only Messiah in the Jewish religion who's a non-Jew. Hmm. I mean, still today, that is the core of civilization. That is the total opposite of what happened October the 7th. Right. Now, to me, that's the obvious way forward because we will kill each other endlessly and we'll never get civilized unless we go down this path. And this is what I call the Persian Hebrew axis, the love between the Persians and the Hebrews. And this is why I'm so involved in the political opposition in Iran and want to get rid of the Mullahs. And I, I don't know if I get a death sentence or a torture chamber waiting for me if I arrive in Iran, but I'm very deeply involved in the struggle against the Mullahs. I want them gone because I believe the tragedy of the Middle East is that Persia and Israel should be united. Right. By, they, the, they by, the their, by their common by their common roots, exactly. which was them trading and exchanging ideas and concepts and children and the whole thing that happened and mysticism and, and mysticism and Kabbalah like you and me right here right Absolutely. now. That is the Middle East. That's what the Middle East should be. And this axis, the Persian axis, is for us now as Westerners what we must go back to because this is the really brilliant, beautiful beginning of Western culture. Where we contributed by inventing concepts like empire nation, city, and invented these concepts larger than tribe that could work. Mm -hmm. And when the Chinese and the Indians eventually developed their different forms of those ideas, they copied the Persians, just like the Romans copied the Persians. And eventually the French copied the Romans and the French taught American Freemasons the beauty of splitting power. The US constitution is originally a Persian innovation coming from Zoroastrianism. Mm -hmm. It's the priest and the chief must be separated and the third, is the matriarch, the cow, Gaia, the community, the people. Mm. And the matriarch is responsible to the people. And this is beautifully done in the US Constitution. Supposedly, we'll see if Robert F. Kennedy can win with your help, but yeah, 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 supposedly yeah, the go. president is, of course, the king. Yep. The Congress, of course, the priesthood. They dictate the law. And the Supreme Court is the bitch. That's mm. the matriarch. Mm -hmm. hold the other two guys responsible <laughs> for keeping their promises. Now, guys, if you don't keep your promises, you don't get to fuck my daughters. Uh. That's fundamentally <laughs> how a society is structured. <laughs>
It's true, isn't it, Bobby? Yeah, yeah. it makes it makes a lot of it makes, makes sense. a lot of sense. Yeah, and this is so deeply ingrained in culture. And what Sorasti was concerned with when he founded his religion, his philosophy, the original philosophy, was that let's get all the supernatural bullshit out of the way. You know, people can believe anything they like. I don't care. But for the elite to run an empire together, they need a court religion that they can believe in, and that must be philosophy itself. And it's forever changing. It's forever working its way towards enlightenment. It's forever learning about the world. Mm -hmm. And this endless pursuit of learning about the world, getting more and more educated about the world, is the pursuit of Asha. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's an impulse for the for unification, just like Cyrus the Great wanted to go in. But how do you unify? And I actually divide these words just in my own linguistics. Empire is the way that most empires, not the way that Cyrus did it. Most empires go in, they kill everybody, they take over, they have absolute control. Everybody's a slave, you know, and it's all about an absolute hierarchical power structure with one ego at the top, who's the emperor, or the imperator. And this is in Star Wars or whatever. There's the the high dark power at the top, and then king. It's opposed by kingdom, which is the good king. Because to me, king is an archetype that means the one who serves the people in his fullness and his fuck and his goodness to the best he can, and the one who will, like Alexander the Great, who of course there was a Greek empire, but will lead. You know, say like, here's my double plumed helmet. I'm the king. If we're going to do this, let me stand in front. And let everybody know that who I is Sorasta's best pal. That's Vishtaspa. And he does that. He constructs the first empire in human history, which is exactly what they call the kingdom here. You yeah. would call it the kingdom. It's in Central Asia. It's full of psychedelic plants, and none of them are banned. Yeah. <laughs> so right. imagine you got, it's a bit like the Chavin Empire in Peru, which yeah, is yeah, amazing. Sure. I'm going mm -hmm. there, by the way, next month again. And so that's I, part I of our shared, away, yeah. that's part of our shared, you know, heritage learning from Don Howard, who. Yes resurrected the old Shavin lineage of the Wachuma practices and the Vilka practices and the psychedelic medicine practices. Yes. From a, and, from and a civilization. the longest period yeah. of peace ever recorded in human history. In history, 800 years Shavin or something. Kingdom of Northern Peru. Yeah, I'm going back to Shaman Duanta next month. I can't, I can't help myself. <laughs> I got to take my, my, yeah. my monks with me and go. Well, it's a great example of the kingdom. But, but the, the kingdom has thing, legal but, psychedelics, exactly, period. Exactly. <laughs> and the same thing actually happened in Central Asia. The thing is that Vistas, but about the same time, was the king who Sorasta was the priest for. So Sorasta did not aspire to be the king. The point is that the priest supports and admires the king for being the king, and the king supports and admires the priest for being the priest. This principle is called the two-headed phallus. And whenever you see like two eagle, two head, two-headed eagle, it's a symbol of that anywhere you find in history. This is how we immunize ourselves as men against worshiping the tyrant. Mm -hmm. We have to avoid a tyrant. And today, turn is coming back. The Chinese Communist Party decided to go big for it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I gave a speech here in Austin this week where I said that it, it sounds really weird. We actually have to fight for a free and open police state. <laughs> mm. It's an impossibility. We still have to do it. Because where things are going now with AI and technology, the free and open police is what we have to do. So I'm a practicing Sorastian, looking at the world right now, which is the biggest challenge for the world to shrink rather than constructively expand. And that would be, of course, to have a police state. Mm -hmm. and, and the Chinese are going for the tyranny because China with commun I mean, Confucianism was never immunized against the worship of the tyrant. The problem Western culture is that Plato in his Republic worshiped the tyrant. So Rasta was adamant, we should not go for the tyrant. Mm -hmm. We must avoid him at all costs. And this is the beauty of the US constitution that was inherited. Like, separate priest and king. And if you're a separate priest and king, you can then separate the yin and the yang, man and woman as well. You can separate the warrior from the soldier. No, mm. I mean, no, no yeah, the warrior no, that, from the hunter, the warrior no, from the hunter. Well, the warrior and soldier, I mean, empire loves soldiers because they will do exactly what you fucking say. True. But they ha empire hates warriors because warriors stand for the good. Yeah. So if they see something and their orders are to kill and they're like, I'm not going that I am not going to kill these people. And there's many stories of these warriors who just go and we have movies of them as heroes who have orders to do something that's bad and they go fuck you. Like I'm not going to do that because I'm a warrior not a soldier. And the warrior can then become the king. Yes. That's the point. Right. Because they because they're Ashavans. Yes. They serve the good. Yeah. Empire empire wants that's slave true. drone mindset if they could make robots out of everybody that would just do everything they say they would because all they care about is power yeah whereas like the ashavanic kingdom cares about the interesting intimacy and complexity 
of everybody's unique will that's bent towards Ashavanic principles, how can we create together? And, and the, what comes in, though, is the difference between warrior and hunter. Mm. Because the hunter has to do his duty every day. And the, the majority of men are fundamentally hunters as an archetype. And the smaller number of men are warriors. But hunters can be warriors if they would have to, if you go to war and you have to defend yourself, right? But the warrior is always the warrior. And the warrior-hunter archetypes must be kept uh, different. If you send somebody out who's only trained to hunt to then go into warfare, you get the Mongol invasion. Because mm. you get these guys who can't tell the difference between the stranger and an animal. And they will therefore treat the stranger as an animal and kill it as it was an animal. They're out hunting. And that's the tragedy of history. The real bloodbaths of history is when these two archetypes are, 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 are mistaken for one another. But we learn archetypes as men. We learn archetypes not by starting with man and woman. This is where I disagree with the yin and the yang. The yin and the yang comes later. We learn archetypes by making distinction between the priest and the chief. Mm -hmm. The priest is basically the smartest or wisest guy, usually older. And we apply the chief or the king onto the strongest guy. The one we look up to with his muscles and his body can actually defend us better than anybody else. So the ultimate warrior who leads the other warriors is the king in that sense. Yeah. And this is how we men start understanding difference. Because we all know that we, are, we must be strong and we must be smart. But one guy is smartest and one guy is strongest. And it's never the same guy. The tyrant is the guy who lies to us and says, I'm both strongest and smartest of you all. Mm -hmm. But that's never the case. There is no such guy. And this is why we need to expose the tyrant before he comes. And in America's case today, there are a lot of guys out there now who, who have started appealing to American monarchy, American dictatorship, and things like that. I just tell them, you can go to China. They try to do it anyway. So why don't you do it there? Yeah. Because I think that's the wrong path to go for America. Well, one of the things that you mentioned, so going back to the, the court system and the Supreme Court being the matriarch, being the one that says, these are the rules. These are the rules of the house. Home Gaia, home United States, whatever our home is, these are the rules of the home. And you men have to figure it out and abide by the rules of the home, right? Like strong matriarch energy. Yes. You know, matrix, matriarch, mater. You know, it's all like, this is all, this is all a part of, they set the, they set the code, they set the pattern. And if you break the code, you know, then there's consequences. Now, one of the things that comes to mind for me is the Supreme Court has held pretty well so far, like the courts have held pretty well so far in the U.S. You know, they're less corrupted, it seems, than the other branches, which seem to be very corrupted. We're getting all of these files of CTIL leaks and censorships and all of these different collusions that they've had, et cetera. So we're like, oh, something a little bit wrong with these other, you know, the, the legislative and the executive branches so far. But the courts have kind of held up. But then you get the, you get the case of a Supreme Court justice who's asked point blank, let's say she's representing the matriarch, and is asked point blank, what is a woman? And she, she can't answer that question. She is supposed to decide whether what things are and what things aren't, and she can't actually describe what a woman is when asked that in congressional so termo. That is so deranged. It's, that it's is like, so it's, it, it seems like a problem. Yes. Because then the matriarch is no longer the matriarch. She's getting confused by these Druzhvanic delusions and ideas so that, that there is no such thing as a woman and there is no such thing as a man. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean that there's, I understand the gender argument and that we're a unique combination oh, I work, of I, masculine I work, I work and feminine. I work with transitions. I work, oh, yeah, I'm of course. Beautiful. It's like, that's all yeah. beautiful, but it doesn't mean that you can't, you shouldn't be able to de no, I, describe a man and woman. My work says that there are two historical sexes called man and woman, undeniably. We now, with hormones, and surgery can add to categories that are called trans man and trans woman. So all I'm saying to Jordan Peterson is says that trans woman is not woman, then I'm just saying, well, woman is not trans woman. <laughs> right, right. Can you please have a little imagination, you know? Yeah, sure. But it's a more cosmetic thing that you can offer to some people that actually often take to that service and they actually quite enjoy yeah, it. One of, my, one of my best friends, yes. Curtis, is one of the leading transition doctors in the world. And he yeah. tells the stories of these people's lives transforming in a super beneficial way and, and mad blessings to that. Yeah, sure. And still, you don't have to have all this confusion and all this no, uh, kind no, no, of no, no, uproar no. No, about I'll it. I tell you what, the people who've gone through transition with me, I, I've even done a podcast in America called Transgender Express, if you want to look into it. We trans people are fantastic and totally agree with me. 
And the Zeta now has just added something more to history we didn't have before, which is, of course, again, Zoroastrian. I mean, technology is incredibly Zoroastrian. We invent new technologies all the time. We all dreamed about talking to people on the other side of the planet. We invented the smartphone. I mean, we invent things all the time, and we then have to learn how to use them wisely, which is, of course, the next project we need to go through, that process called dialectics. I don't have a problem with that at all. But, it, but the fact that nature itself is based on man or woman because it's based on reproduction that has to have two sexes, just, it's just ridiculous to try to deny that. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's so many traps and places that we get lost. And I would assume that the Zoroastrians would say that, again, this is not just a random coincidental confusion, but there's actually a force Angra Menu and the other Druzhvanic entities that yeah. are that are actually trying from an extraplanetary perspective, working in us, as us, and through us, of course, to actually confuse us, delude us, fuck us up, bring us into less expansion and more contraction and more control. So it's not just that people are getting you got confused. A, you've got quite There's a few a people who are, live a very resentful lives and enjoy their own resentment towards life and they help out quite a lot too. Um, so I would say the problem, I see it very clearly from Scandinavia because Scandinavia is ahead of America here. We have paid a very high price for the secularization of the West. Dropping Christianity has been enormously costly. And what people have done is that they can't live without religion. So what they've done is that they placed religion, which was decent, with an even worse religion, which is called ideology. Mm. So political ideology like has idol, taken idol, all, idolology. Yeah, it does. And an ideology in in the Western context, it starts with Rousseau and the Jacobins. Today, it's called woke culture. Um, fights biology and nature itself, and that to me is to fight Dasha. You're right. In my, That's the in my contemplation in the morning, the first thing is total acceptance of the world as it is. This is Nietzsche's Amor Fati. There's a reason why Nietzsche named his most famous book after Zoroaster. He Zoroaster. knew about the historical figure. He, he knew what his ideas were. People read the Avesta in Germany in the 1900s when it arrived from Iran. It was high culture. Hegel and Nietzsche were really learned about these. They, they learned both about Indian and Iranian culture at the time. So he knew what he was talking about. And this what I fundamentally do in my meditation in the morning is to totally accept nature and biology as the fundament of all existence. And then on top of that biology, I can imagine, for example, technology, which is what we human beings do. I can imagine culture. So culture is just nature 2.0, based on nature. But if you try to fight and deny nature and how nature operates, you're completely delusional. And this started with Rousseau and then eventually led to Robespierre and the Jacobins during the French Revolution. And this is why in, in this book, Process and Event, my latest book, I, I write about these guys. I call them the pillar saints of history. They're the guys who deny that nature exists. And they say that, no, everything is a social construction. Mm. Actually, it isn't. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you are yourself a product of nature. <laughs> you're right. born out of a mother's womb. <laughs> we don't do artificial babies, at least not yet. And you're mm -hmm. not one of them. Mm -hmm. So you're very much a product of nature. And the only thing we humans have done and tried to do with civilization in the last three or 4,000 years is try to build a culture on top of nature that doesn't deny or fight with nature, but actually embraces nature and builds from it. Yeah. And we what, need religion more than ever, and we need to get the political ideologists out of the way. And I think you and I represent that. We're going down the mystical path, you and I, with Kabbalah yeah. and Sufism. We're going down that path to explore what that means and to be deeply religious as a man. And the first thing we do is to acknowledge that nature is amazing and we have to worship in front of nature. This is when I worship the Ahura. When I then worship the culture, I worship the master. Mm -hmm. One of the things about nature that I think is also trying to be denied and you know kind of defiled and degraded is the idea of competition. Yeah. And competition is in nature all the way up and all the way down and it's in our nature. We're going to compete. That's why capitalism works is because it allows for competition which creates more evolution, creativity, expansiveness, innovation, all of these different things. We're always going to compete and it's about just setting the rules of the competition so that the rules can't be bent in a way that they're skewed. So this late stage crony capitalism where the corporate powers have so much power over the, the matriarch, the, the courts and power over the king and power over the, 
the people, you know, the Congress and the, and the House and all of that, they have so much power that they exert that they're not playing fair anymore. It's like if somebody, has, if somebody was a wealthy enough basketball player, they could just make a rule that everybody had to move out of the way when they went down the lane. Well, they would score every time, right? Like they're not playing fair. So it's like, it's our job. It's not the problem with capitalism. The problem is, is that the king hasn't held strong. He's given into the seductions of the money and the, and the control of these you know, corporate powers yeah. and the mother's given in some control. And then the people have given up some control and everybody's been captured by this thing. And so a big part of this and what I think Bobby Kennedy stands for is to come in the return of the motherfucking King and say, enough, we're I'm going to create a fair game, a fair game. And there's going to be real actual competition and which rep- which he's representing is competing against the whole system because the whole system has been swallowed and and captured by these by these forces. Yes. And he's going to stand and say no. I like shed off all of those shackles and say no. Now we got a fair playing field. And, and it's especially among men. So if you work spiritually with men you discover that fair competition is fundamental to their own identity. Mhm. Um I go as far in the book as to say that it's actually a hatred of the phallus itself to deny competition <laughs> and its enormous contribution to culture. Right. It's, it's, it, it's, it's hatred of the dick, <laughs> what it stands for. The right. phallus stands precisely for this. Fair competition is phallic. Mm-hmm. And we men must pursue that. When I do spiritual work with men, especially young men in Scandinavia, and they're completely lost, they hear me on one of those podcasts that I do in Sweden, they contact me and, and the guys that I work with, and we get them into men's work. The first thing we do is to send them off to nature, back into nature, so they can survive in nature, and then martial arts. Yeah. So they can go competitive. And it's, they love it. I can't try. They finally, I, if you, yeah, yeah. this is so me, I should be doing this. Yeah, and, and don't go to one of those studios that mix the men and the women in the same place. Go to a martial arts studio for men only and learn how to be man among men and fight it out and respect the guy who beats you. And, it, and it, you know, the one thing they love the most to get beaten. Of course. I mean, there's something. Another guy can be stronger or better than they are. There's something, they love it. There's they love something it. deeply trustable exactly. when you can actually meet another, meet another one of your brothers and yeah. compete and yes. like really actually feel their strength and their power and their, and their desire to beat you. And you can allow all of that competition and all of your badness, all that shit talking all of the way that like when I, I'm about to play basketball after this podcast, right? I got, I got the boys coming. We've been talking shit all week. It's been a, you know, December 9th game. I'm off like, to the pool. Of the yeah, yeah for sure. The but there. this is like, <laughs> we, we live for it. And, and this yeah. is the only thing we finished two, three hours playing like hard, hard games. And we're just, our bodies are wrecked. And we're like, one more, one more. Yeah. One more. Cause we love it. We like love the ability to actually test yourself against your brothers and it creates this deepened bond of friendship that transcends what it, what many friendships can be when when brothers can get together and do that and it's also why in the fit for service program that I teach and coach this year with the other coaches we had a lot about sacred competition so we got kendo swords you know and put on all the gear and we would square off with oh that's so beautiful. kendo and it was yeah, yeah, it was yeah. epic like it was like it was it was beautiful because Boxing and Muay Thai, the problem is head trauma. It's actually physical hardware damage that you're doing. Jiu-Jitsu is amazing. And, you know, still, if you don't know leg locks and things like that, you can rip a knee out or, you know, it's hard to like get everybody involved in a Jiu-Jitsu unless you've been trained in the, in the arts. So you understand how, when to tap, when not to tap. But with Kendo, it just allows that pure animalistic competition force to be pushed through the phallus of the sword and say like, this is my phallus and this is me competing against your phallus, your sword. It's literally crossing swords. It's why actually, you know, crossing, crossing dicks is also called crossing swords yes. in pop culture. It's like legitimately the sword is your phallus. It's your discernment. It's your, it's your thrust. It's your, it's your drive. And when you literally cross swords, then there's something that is emerging out of there. It's I know. not like we're hiding our phallus worship here. <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly. Oh, I'm just going to do sword This play. is the lesson learned from Zoroastrianism. This is the contest of the Ahura, of the body itself. Like Once you've learned to enjoy that and understand the beauty of it and the capacity of it, which is also the training of the warrior, it's part of that, then you can also do the mind. And you can understand mind is also competitive. It's a competition between ideas. Mm. This is public debate. Of course. These are learned guys, the older guys who are learned have lived long lives, go up and fight each other over the ideas. And, and you listen to them, you learn from them, and you make up your own mind. And then you 
retry that again. So once we've learned to be competitive in the physical, physiological in the body, then we also understand the beauty of, 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 the, of, the, of the competition between ideas. And this is what Zoroastrianism calls master. So what we Zoroastrians say is that our so Buddhist brothers essentially stay within the Ahura. We call them Ahura Yasni. Like they are worshiping being, which a Buddhist would agree with. They're mm. worshiping being, they're staying in the being. We go from being, which is perfectly fine to worship, to go into worship of the mind. Mm. And this we call master yasna. This which, is mind worship. Which is the deep problem with the censorship and the squashing of debates and not allowing people to actually allow their ideas to be contested in a public oh, I, in a public venue. It's fucking crazy that the they're trying to suppress and censor all of these contesting ideas, whether it's ideas, medical ideas about COVID or whether it's political ideas, you got to let them square off and fight it out. And also we saw a super degraded form of this debate in Trump-Biden debates, which weren't debates. They were just like using parlor tricks and defamations and ad hominem attacks. And it was all bullshit. There was no real Mazda. It's ironic politics. It's ironic. There's no it's Mazda. Ironic, there was no yeah. battle of the minds. It's only TV show. It's ironic. Yeah. Totally ironic. Yep. That's why people will vote for Trump over Biden, I believe, next year for the simple reason that he at least at least is honest about his irony. But we'll see if Kennedy comes into the race. We get a, a chance to have a guy who represents the, the return of the presidency as it should be, like you would call the king, yep. the proper king. We'll see how it goes. But I, I totally support you in that. that <laughs> Fuck yeah. Yeah. But I see from the outside. Yeah, absolutely. See. Yeah. Um, and we have another note here. I do come from Sweden. We have a little person called Greta Thunberg here as involved as well. Uh, you know, the irony here, you know, I, I was in the music industry for 25 years and mm -hmm. I actually wrote Greta Thunberg's mother's big hit song. <laughs> no way. Yeah. I wrote that song. I know the family. Uh-huh. Her name is Malena. She's an opera singer. And, and she wanted to do a pop record. And you know what the title is of that song? You can find it on Spotify, by the way. Malena, her name is Malena. The song's called Tragedy. <laughs> and it's, it's almost like I wrote about her daughter. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so what, so what are your, what are your thoughts? Greta Thunberg comes from the same country that I do. So what are your thoughts? I don't, so I don't, I'm not super familiar. I, I know I, who she I, is. I think Greta Thunberg and her followers are going down the totalitarian route. They are the Jacobins today. I know the German and Israeli secret police are very concerned with her and her followers right now. I've said all along that whenever these pacifists and vegetarians show up in history and pride themselves in their lifestyle, which is like denying education, hey, <laughs> I don't go to school. I'm so smart that I have to go to school. You know, that's the pillar saint in history. And the pillar saints are incredibly dangerous. And it's the pillar saints who teach us we should deny biology itself. Mm -hmm. They go after nature itself. Because nature itself must be reconstructed into something weird that they know what it is. And apparently they are the ones who have the solution, right? I'm not surprised that all the Greta Thunberg dropped climate because she wasn't really interested in climate. She's much more interested in herself than in anything else. Mm -hmm. She inherited that from her mother. And I say this, they can assume as much as they like, but... It, it, to me, it's clear that's the case. <laughs> so she dropped climate. Oh, no, we don't do climate. No, she kisses the ass of Hamas. Hmm. Wait a second. Weren't there some Germans in the 1970s that blew up like half of Europe called the Bader Meinhof League? And what happened with the Bader Meinhof League who thought they were so fucking fancy? Oh, they went to Palestine and hang out with a gang called the Black September. And they started blowing up, you know, flights over Europe and things like that because they hated the Jews. It's the same thing again. I think, honestly, Greta Thunberg and her followers, especially in Germany, are going towards becoming a green Bader Meinhof. These, these forces are incredibly dangerous. Yeah, because she's they, 20 they years old now. She's not a girl any longer. You can't just dismiss her and say, oh, she's a girl. She doesn't know anybody. You can't. She's a 20 year old, very sharp woman with a very, very clear cut narcissistic agenda. And she thinks she's totally superior to you and me. She knows best. This is the tyrant, but it is the princess tyrant that we call her in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Victor Wilhelm and I have identified the princess tyrant. This time around, the tyrant is a 20 year old girl. Because mm. nobody's allowed to speak against her. Mm -hmm. She won't listen to differing opinion. Mm -hmm. She will tell you, no, we all know that Israel is evil, they're colonizers, as if Israelis haven't always lived in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. As if not 900,000 Jews left Arab countries and moved to Israel in 1948 to escape their world and oppression so they could finally be Jews in their own home country. As if that did not occur to anybody. 
as if not two million Arabs live in Israel as Israeli citizens. All of this is completely denied by Greta Thunberg and her followers. They're going into a very dark place. Well, this the idea is that what's interesting is is in all of these there's almost a spark of goodness. They think it's like the false light. They think they're yeah. actually serving. They actually think they're serving the good, and they think they're serving the whole. Like everybody who is coercing, shaming, pressuring other people into getting you know, getting the jab, get the vac, pressure, pressure, yes, shame, yes, yes. use anything you yes. can, because that's what makes you virtuous. They're hijacking our natural inherent draw and allurement to the uh, Ashavanic path, the, to, to Asha, to yeah. the good. They're hijacking that and not realizing that their own narcissism and their own ego games, the desire to virtue signal to be better than another person based on a set of rules that you've created that makes you better and it's all of this hierarchical, this tyrannical power. This is precisely what a narcissist is. A narcissist yeah. mistakes his or her own ego for being good. Right. Like, I, I am supremely good just because I exist. No, you're not. Goodness is a struggle every day to go into constructive mindset, to serve others, not you. Mm -hmm. That's a struggle every day. And it means nothing if your acts don't follow your thinking. Yeah. It means nothing. Not going to school is not impressive. It's a non-act. How can you how can you encourage millions of kids out there not to go to school? Well, schools are What kind gives of, you the right to do that? Schools right? are kind of fucked up. They are, but it's even worse not to go to them at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, or not have parents to homeschool you whatever. Well, I mean the idea of the but, pursuit you know, the idea of the pursuit of real knowledge the pursuit is, is, the pursuit, is, is, this is, this is what, essential. Okay. But I'd much I rather have him go to Jordan Peterson. It's probably as much Academy. as you do, but I love Gnosticism when it's monist. But the Gnostic dualists have always been the curse of humanity. And the perfect Gnostic dualist who thinks she doesn't need to know anything because she knows everything already perfectly is Greta Thunberg. Uh -huh. Watch out for these characters in history. They've always been, they always smile at first and they're green and their whatever goodness whatever and then they get bloody and when they don't get their way they well get it's like mal i That's mean what mal, 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 mal started, mal started like the we're all the farmers you're gonna get the, yep. you're gonna get to own the land and you're gonna get bountiful and then 80 million genocidal deaths later and starvations later it's all power it's all control as soon as it's all beautiful promises Oh, this is going to be lovely, lovely, beautiful. And then they get power, and then it's either the guillotine, or it's starvation, or it's the guns, or it's whatever, or the fucking concentration camp, whatever the fuck it is, it always turns that way. Like, this is just, this do, is just. Do you know Pol Pot? No. Pol Pot was the dictator oh, yeah, yeah, in yeah, Cambodia yeah. who yeah, murdered yeah. like two million of his own countrymen before they got rid of him, right? Do you know what Pol Pot wrote his PhD on at Sorbonne in France in 1967 before he went back to Cambodia and slaughtered his own people? Hmm. He wrote his PhD on Rousseau. <laughs> Rousseau is also the hero of Greta Thunberg. Rousseau was the hero of Adolf Hitler. Rousseau was the hero of Mao. It wasn't Why? Karl Marx, it was Why? Rousseau. Why? What, what was, the, what was the, core, what's the core of Rousseau's teachings that has allured people the to The core of Rousseau's teaching is that we are naturally goodness in ourselves and we don't have to do anything about it. And we can just walk out in the world and be this goodness. And therefore, anything that stands in our way of pursuing our narcissistic traits is evil and must be removed. Mm. It's appealing directly to the ego in the worst possible form. I can think of anything more druge than Rousseau. And this is the curse we had of Western culture and all the terrible mistakes any more, made in any the more druge, Any more uh, in the druge than yeah. Rousseau? Yeah. yeah. The tabula rasa. Mm -hmm. No, the tabula rasa, again. Oh no, we're born, we're born without sex because we're just socially constructed as men or women. Bullshit. We're born with hormones everywhere, as any transsexual can tell you as well. Their problem is that their brains is one thing and genital organs look a bit different. Well, then help them out with that. Doesn't change the fact the vast majority of men, 99.5% of men and women, gay or straight, doesn't matter, are perfectly happy to be men and women. And they should be, and they are. And that's an undeniable fact. Mm -hmm. Rousseau hated that. Mm. He hated that. Yeah, it's a so war this against nature. is the problem. This is what we write in the book about. We call the pillar saints of history, and they always start with a smile and walk around with their goodness, the smirky faces. But once you start looking around a few years later, they're the ones who love the guillotine the most, and they love killing their enemies because they really want things to be their way. Yeah, all their way is against they they, nature they, itself. They think they have a monopoly on their understanding of the good. Yes, and once you have a monopoly, and you are that you've conflated yourself with the good, which 
lives in you and as you and through you, hopefully, but always beyond you. You always bow to the mystery of the greater goodness and try to follow it and purify, clarify as much as you can. But you're bound by this field that is real. There's a structure that's real. And you bow before the mystery of that structure, which even the greatest mind can't fully actually explore and understand. It's It's not our privilege to get to that perspective, but certain prophets like Zarathustra should do their best to try yes. and to try and download through their own, you know, hermeneutic prism, their own way of understanding the the truth that's always available that we find when we're in psychedelic ceremonies. And we find the truth that comes through. Sometimes it's through vision. And or all feeling of that, all thought. of that is about embodiment. It's about embodiment all the time. I always repeat the word. When things go wrong, you either have a pillar saint or what I call a boy pharaoh in front of you. The pillar saint is the guy who hates everything beneath his own throat. But he also hates anything beneath your throat. It's all mind without body. Mm-hmm. He's a dualist. It's the, all mind yeah. without body. Because the body is real. This world. Yeah. He hates this world. This world is created by the demiurge. This world is evil. We must leave this world and go to some other place where only spirits exist and nothing is physical. This is a guy who hates sex. Mm-hmm. And he won't deal with violence except his own passive aggressions that are enormous, right? This is the guy. The other guy is the guy who hates everything above his throat. He's the boy pharaoh. He will only go for the muscles and for the energy in his body, but he hates anybody who can think because his thinking is not the best thinking you would find him. He has no sense of humor. And he's the other guy we have problems with in history. This is the guy who just runs off to the next village and slaughters everybody and kills them because he doesn't know any better. With no intention at all, with warfare or anything, there's no point to it. He's just revengeful, constantly revengeful. What we're doing in our teaching, both you and I, is that we teach him that you're both above your throat and beneath your throat. And if you're better at one of the two, then that's your contribution to the community and your archetype. And what you're obliged to do is to admire the guys who have the other half. Right. If you're good at mind, admire the guys who have the body. If you're not very good at martial arts, but you're good at the mind games, I'll take you to a martial arts gala. I'll put you on front seat and you'll scream your voice off because you will love those guys who stand there admiring these two heroes fighting it out in the ring. Mm -hmm. You will love it. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be their audience. You're supposed to be their voyeur because they will then look at you when you go into a hectic debate where ideas are being mashed with each other and crushed against each other and all that. They will admire you for being the smart guy who can do the same thing with ideas that they do with bodies. This is how a society must work. And this is what masculinity is. And I'm totally for this unification, this admiration between the priest and the chief as fundamental archetypes. Right. And this, this is what we're preaching. We are allergic to the people who walk out in the world today and are pillar saints, for example, and we discover them by the not having a sense of humor, being full of themselves, and they hate at least half of themselves, meaning they hate at least half what humanity is. Yeah, laughter and fuck. If, exactly. if you're not tapped into laughter and fuck, you're missing the point. You're somehow. missing the point. I always, I've always said that you can tell a spiritual master by the sound of their laughter. I like, say the same thing I said. I'm a philosopher. Don't ever trust a guy who calls himself a philosopher who doesn't look like he's got a great sex life. Because <laughs> if philosophy hasn't delivered a great sex life to him, he's number one, a really mediocre philosopher, and he's probably <laughs> full of it in his head, and he hates people of great sex lives, and that's going to be all that comes out of his mouth. Uh-huh. You know, Freud was so damn right. And always when people hate me for saying that Freud was right, they go up against Freud. I just look at them and I say, how's your sex life, brother? And I expose them instantly. They have terrible <laughs> sex lives. You know? yeah. But that's what we preach. You do it. I do it. We just do it on two different sides of Atlantic. But that's why I admire your work. And it's an honor to be here. I, I think yeah. that's what we're doing. Yeah. When he's so, one thing I didn't understand is he talks about the mantras. Zoroaster, yeah. Zoroaster, Zoroaster talks about the mantras. What are the mantras? Because we know mantras, they come, I know it from the, you know, Hindu path, the Kajmer Shai, the, the, all the whole, that whole path, like mantras, Om Mani Padne, Padne Hum, you know, mantras that you can yeah, say. We, we, is that, was that what that is? In English, we use it that way. Mantra is a word that actually, if you look at it etymologically, its origin, it means that something is repeated. Mm-hmm. So it can be a person, it can be a mantra. So in Saurashtra, you can be mantra. That means you. it's another form of saying you're a Bedin or a Nashavan. They have all these beautiful words for being a good Saurashtra. Like Bedin means you're a contributor, 
member of the community. You be it din. You, you're allied with the faith, din. And you be it, you support the faith, you, you do the faith. Ashra means you practice Asha, and you're also then enhancing Asha in the world by practicing Asha, therefore you're an Asha mm -hmm. So the same thing can be said about the mantra. So mantra is used in different ways depending on context. But because a lot of the way you do this is, it's all, the text is poetic because that's how you memorized it. You have to remember that before we, even up until the point we got the printing press in like 1450, memorizing a text was absolutely essential. Right. This text, the Gospels, was very likely memorized for several hundred years before it was written down. Mm -hmm. And then it was written down. And of course, then you discover it's a verse. So it's, it's rhyming. It's, it, Gospels literally means the songs. It was sang. You sang the songs to memorize Sorastra and his relationship towards Ahura and towards Masta and what it means to be good Sorastra. Mm -hmm. So the word mantra is depending on context, I would answer. Yeah. What about? But that's what you mean. When you use the mantra, we say, I, I repeat the words. Right. It's not the words that are the mantra. It's the repetition of the words which is the mantra. And, or the repetition of that good action. Yes. You know, so it's practice. Yes. In another way. Because pra practice is repetition. How do you practice exactly. free throws? You fucking and shoot free throws. And if you're good in doing the good repetition, you are mantra. You uh -huh. become the guy who does the mantra. Uh-huh. Yeah. I understand that. What about what about holidays, festivals? Did, is there any of that, you know, recollection in the? There are four of them. There are four. Okay, tell me about tell me about Zoroastrian uh, holidays. There's the spring equinox and the fall equinox. No, the, the, <laughs> of course the, the equinox, it is. And there's the winter solstice and the summer solstice. God damn it. I, that's what I thought. We celebrate that, all four. Of uh, course. And this is the thing. Of course, because we're in the, all this. All Iranians do Novros. So this is the thing. It's a lot of Zoroastrianism in Iranian culture. Um, it, you have to go to an Iranian New Year's uh, celebrity. It's in March, either the 20th or 20th usually. It's the same point in time all over the world. The exact time of the tropical New Year is the spring equinox. And it's celebrated called Novruz, which literally means the new turn or the new year. Mm -hmm. It's a huge thing with Iranians and in Central Asia, Afghans celebrate Novruz. So this is something even the Muslims, they celebrate Novruz. And then you do the other, you got the Tirgan, the Mergan. And the funny thing is that what you celebrate mid-December is called Yalda. And Yalda is the original Yuletide. So the English word Yule comes from Yalda, which originally is a Western Sanskrit Indo-European celebration of the winter solstice, mm -hmm. the darkest night of the year. And what you do as a Sorastian, if you live in Australia, you just switch it around. Mm -hmm. You do Novros in September. Right. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's very practical. They don't celebrate anything else because when somebody died, they've died and you celebrate your community, your Anjuman, you celebrate the Anjuman constantly. You celebrate the Anjuman every day when you meditate because you're part of your community. Yeah. So you don't need a specific date for that. There, there are no other days you would celebrate. Is there any, is there any kind of structures, you know, now we're getting into social structures, which may not pertain to this religion, but were there social structures of within the con bounds of relationship, you know, like certainly traditional monogamy has deep Christian influence in the ideas that are around it. What are, what is the, what are the Zoroastrians ideas of man, woman relating and marriage? And is that related to the religion? Of course, most of the time in the U S still there's pastors, Christian pastors who are officiating most of the weddings. And I hate going to weddings because I think there's great beauty in the teachings of Yeshua, mad blessings. And I've felt contact with that force that I would call Yeshua and been blown away. And so I, the deepest bow, I'm not, you know, I'm on team. Like people are like, you need to bring, you need to bring Jesus in your life. You're like too late. I love, I love Yeshua, but Christianity, I have some problems with like fundamentally. And, and so they're kind of guiding these marriages. And it seems like there's an, a desire, at least I have, for this evolving understanding of lots of these different practices, birth, death, marriage, you know, all of these different things. Do, do the Zoroastrians cover all of these major moments in a, in a yeah, person's life? Yeah, they celebrate life? them. But like the first time I came to India in the 1980s, I went out with these Parsis and I went out with some elderlies. 
uh, the Parsis of India, they're the Jews of India, basically. They roam the country. There are 200,000 of them, and they own everything, so including the national airline. <laughs> you know, the Tata family are Zoroastrians, right? So I, I, I just hang out with them and, and learn their culture. And, you know, you, you're kind of discreet. You're sort of invited into community, and you're like, so what's your attitude towards sex? And they're like, oh, oh, no problem at all. Let's go to the Shiva Shakti temple. <laughs> right. So and I literally walk into an orgy with these people who are like in their late 70s. You know, it's just like, uh, no, that's not a problem at all. You know, we we self-arrange our marriages. We don't have our marriages arranged by our, our grandfathers like the Hindus do. We self-arrange our marriages. We arrange them in between us. And I got offered from Parsi women to marry them. Like, it, it, you know, running a family is a corporation to the Zoroastrians. Is uh-huh. running a corporation. It's like, you marry a woman who's solid and she will respect you for it. You sleep with her a couple of times and have a couple of kids and the kids go to Harvard and Stanford. They all do. <laughs> all the Sarasin kids go to these elite schools, you know. So uh, they arrange the marriages and the marriages last. Probably a generality. Divorce rate is very low. All, but, <laughs> but they obviously can sleep with anything they like. It's just like, so being gay is not an issue. You right. can still get married and have children with a woman if you're a gay man. You can just go off and have gay sex with gay guys. <laughs> they don't care. Like, my discoveries were asking what they didn't care. And that, of course, led me on to their attitude towards psychedelics. And I was in Mumbai. <laughs> One of these DOS tours is like an Indian Zoroastrian priest. You know, they have very long traditions. Everything in India has been around for a long time. You might not even ask when it started because they might not even know. But this guy was drinking bull's pee. So I was just this Western guy, philo- philosophy student. I was in India and he was drinking the bull's pee and with me. And he's just like... Yeah, but like, okay, you drink bull's pee. It's not the first thing I drink. It's not champagne, you know. Mm. So I'm like, uh, what did you feed the bull? And he's just like, Shh, you must not ask. It's probably Amanita Muscaria, right? Of course. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that whole thing. They drink the bull's pee because they give the drugs that they can't digest to the bull. That's why the bull is sacred. Yeah. And then they drink the bull's pee full of the damn drug and off they go. I mean, well, that's the, where the Santa Claus myth of the Amanita muscaria mushroom exactly. given, given to the reindeer and then the shamans, the Zautars of that region, they would drink the piss of the reindeer. They'd dress up in red and white and they would go deliver presents to the kids and they'd be jolly and jolly and red-faced because they're drunk on this GABA agonist which comes through the Amanita muscaria mushroom yep. and all's good and now we have fucking Christmas and reindeer <laughs> and Santa Santa Claus in red and white, all based on this mushroom. But you're saying that it was also mimicked in other cultures with bulls, of course. Yeah. So I discovered that the Homa, which Sorastor talks about in the Gothas, he calls himself a Sautar. The Homa is, is the, the Iranian version of the Indian Soma. But here's the trick. Iran and Central Asia is full of psychedelic plants. So their Homa was far more potent than anything you ever drink in India when you drink the Soma. Mm-hmm. India essentially just has three different psychedelic or, or drug traditions, and that's the cannabis, that's the opiates, and that's the shrooms. Those are the three things you find in India, naturally. Africa is the same way. That's why African shamans do tons of mushrooms, because that's what they have. Yeah, well, they have you, a boga. you take what you have. They have a boga, but the boga is different because the boga is basically a rite of passage thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not a drug you take constantly because sure. then you blow your brains out. It, boga is specifically something you should do once in your life. It's a bit like 5-MeO-DMT in Mexico, which according to Mexicans, the sapito or something, you do it once in your life. If you're going to do it repeatedly, you better have a really good reasons why you do it again, because the memory of the experience is good enough, right? So these traditions are the ones you have. When you then came to Iran, this research is being done today. One of my best friends, I've done podcasts with him, is Shohin Ekminam. He lives in Vancouver, Canada. He's an Iranian-Canadian. He runs a psychedelic startup in, in California. He's a great guy, sweetest guy ever. Shohin has gone back to Iran and Afghanistan and traced to find every minor ingredient you could have in the original Homa. Because Islam has fought these behaviors really, really hard. Islam, just like Christianity, has gone after anybody who's ever used psychedelics because they hate both alcohol and psychedelics. Islam is a religion without well, fun. And, and they Let's hate, put it that way. Yeah, and, yeah. They hate, and they hate the But the Sufis, dancing, of course, the Sufis, dancing, of course, did it dancing anyway. Dancing and the beauty and the beautiful and, like, and the goddess herself. Anything that gets you embodied in your body, like in your fuck. They hate in your, music, for God's sake. Yeah, know? exactly. But the Sufis protested, always did it, which is why the Zoroastrian tradition in Iran survived under the umbrella of Sufism. Shaheen is one of the experts working on this at the moment. I put him in contact with guys here in the States 
who now go to Mexico and Peru and try to find all the plants there and work with Mexicans and Peruvians. I think we're doing fantastic work right now, rewriting the history of psychedelics, finding all the plants that people have used and discovering their properties and see also what we can do when we do the different mixes of these different psychedelics. Mm -hmm. You're involved with this work. I'm involved with this work. A guy like Shuhin is fantastic. You want to have him on the show, invite him. He's a great guy. He lives in Vancouver. I actually discovered him because he was running the biggest Persian cultural festival in North America on his own when he was just a kid. Wow. And then I learned that he was seriously a Zoroastrian and interested in psychedelics. And that was his journey. What if, if you want to study Sufism, obviously I've read a lot of Rumi, I've read a, read a lot of Hafiz. And it's, love those it's guys. beautiful, I right? Love them. Like it's, you got you to gotta fucking yes. love them. You know? I'm and, totally and, into it. And if you want to actually pursue that, I mean, you call yourself a Zufi. So you're this kind of unique blend of Sufism and Zoroastrianism. And how did you study on the Sufi path? You know, to actually like, who do you, who do you, who do you work with now? Because I understand you can read. You have Rumi. to live with them. Uh huh. It's sacred knowledge. Yeah. And this is a weird today. We got the internet and everything is published, but we're also learning now that some things should never be online. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this is this is a public conversation we're having. So I'm not going to talk about the golden ritual with you, mm -hmm. but we can talk about it. We turn off the cameras and the microphones. So sacred knowledge must not be passed into the public. And this is the difference between Tantra and Sutra in old Eastern religions. And I think we have to import that distinction here. I argue in Protestant event, it has to be important. Tantric knowledge is knowledge about absolutely everything, ultimate truth about everything, but not everybody can handle it. Mm -mm. So keep it in a specific Tantric space, a Tantric container. A temple. Yes. Sutra, or mystery school. Sutra yeah. is what we teach people in general in a society to keep a society together. Sutric knowledge is the knowledge that we present to people to make them love their children and keep society at whole. Mm -hmm. That's the sutra. But if you want to pursue the tantra and you're the right person for it, you have the psyche to do it, you need to find your own tantric teacher and go down the tantric path. Mm -hmm. The way I, I say Tantra to Westerners today, I'll say it, it's about sex and drugs and psychoanalysis. <laughs> don't do any of the three unless you really know what you're doing, yeah. right? And don't do them without guidance from somebody who really knows what you're, what, what you're up to, right? So this is tantric knowledge. And the difference between Tantra and Sutra is an important distinction here. And what we're learning now is that we cannot publish things online if it's tantric. So you cannot become a Sufi in an online course. Right. I work right now with a fantastic new male yoga academy, Bavaria, Germany. They're going to publish every damn yoga moment you could possibly do. They're doing Nath, which is like hardcore Indian masculine yoga. And we're going to give it to the men's movement for free in Europe. They can learn all the movements on YouTube for free, right? That's fantastic. That's sutra. But the tantric knowledge cannot be published online. Mm -hmm. Because if you publish the tantric knowledge online, you cause havoc in the world. A shaman will tell you this when you come to the Amazonas or you come to Iran, the shaman or the sautar will tell you, you must never ever tell this to people where in your culture when you go back to it, because if this plant was found in the streets of New York, you would have hell on earth in your culture. We already have that problem with fentanyl right now in the United States. This is a perfect example of something that should have been locked up. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl is now killing hundreds of thousands of Americans every year, and it's gonna get, it's gonna get even worse. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have even more advanced opiates 50 times more potent than fentanyl out of the markets very soon. And while it's going to cause enormous havoc. This is the real threat over long term for humanity we're dealing with when sacred knowledge gets out in the open in the public. Yeah. You must be prepared to share the sacred knowledge. You must learn it directly from the master. You must be the disciple of the master. And this is what you do when you learn Zen. This is what you do when you learn Sufism. This is what you do when you learn these traditions. This is what you do when you learn Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Mark Gaffney is a shared friend of ours and he's mm -hmm. teaching you and all that. So the, the, you cannot do Kabbalah. You're also discovering Kabbalah that this is sacred knowledge in the public. Sure. Christianity and Islam never allowed this. They just straightforwardly called Tantra sin mm. and banned it and said it must be locked up because they believe in transparency at all times. That's why Christianity and Islam were perfect feudal religions. They were perfect for a power that wanted to see everything you did. Mm -hmm. So you had to be transparent towards power so power could control you. Christianity and Islam were popular, spread around the world because they were perfect feudal religions. I think they've come to the point in time we have to drop them or totally reform them and go back to genuine spirituality. And that starts with the separation of Tantra and Sutra. I even have a word for it in Protestant event, a Greek word, so we can include it in Western culture. It's called aditonology. 
The added tone in the Greek language is the inner sanctum of the temple. The added tonality the are the specific holies. laws, the specific rules that are only applicable to the inner sanctum of the temple. Mm -hmm. That means there are no laws at all. Which would be like the catacombs in Chavin, or it would be, you know, there's certain places where they would do, that's where they would do Vilka, which is a snorted blend of 5-MeO, DMT. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh, the, you're sacred, getting close, you're getting close. The, I, the sacred, the, the it was, they called it the sacred for a the reason. The Vilka tradition is it's a perfect example of something that, yeah, some of it is out, people know about the plant and people are searching for it, so they have enough information to try to find that path, but you got to go to the Amazonas or you got to go to the highlands, rather, in Peru to do the Velka tradition. It's based on me mescaline on top of the Velka. This is the priest initiation ceremony that obviously both you and I have done with Don Howard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but it's not for everybody at all. No, and, and when you it's go not. to do Velka, he says, he looks at you and is smiling, you know, j white jaguar, you know, Torongo Blanco face. And he says, are you ready to die? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and, you, and you have to say, mm-hmm. And then yeah. if you do and say, uh-huh, then you take an, an old knuckle bone from an old shaman and you snort the, snort the vilka and it's a, it's a death process. Yeah, it's, it's, an initi it's an initi initiation. Well, we're literally not doing it in the studio here today in front of the cameras. <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> because you're not it's not, yeah. It's, it's a sacred knowledge. It's sacred knowledge. It's not for everybody to pursue. So don't go down that path. I mean, this is why in all shamanic traditions, intention and integration are the two key things. The intention means that you sit down and ask yourself seriously. Again, you do the Sorasta meditation. Is this a constructive thing I'm doing or am I being in a destructive mode right now? And if you discover anything destructive about you taking that drug, don't do it. Don't have sex with that woman either. You know, if anything destructive is going on, get that out of your head first. Mm. That's the intention. And then integration afterwards. How do you integrate that enormously intense experience that goes off in so many different directions? How do you integrate that to, again, be even more constructive the next day? That's what integration is. All the shamanic traditions are built on this. Intention, ceremony, integration. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. And that includes the sacred knowledge rituals too. So the rise and the proliferation of these new temples and mystery schools, I've also seen as essential. Like yes, it, it, we have to return. We have to bring tantra back. Secularization into. did not work. It's disastrous. And so, bringing that all back into culture seems like a a huge part of what we're here to do is to find, to go to the sacred places, learn the sacred knowledge, and then it's interesting because some part of me says, "Well, fuck, just democratize it all, open source everything," because we we don't have time. But I, I hear your point and what you're saying is no, that there's I, that's something... that's anarchy. And I think spiritual anarchy is not what we want to give people. Right. So that may not be actually the most productive way to do it. There may, it, it may take more time, but building up the temples and the structures and allowing the sacred to remain the sacred. Also, sometimes, a lot of times you can speak the truth into the marketplace and nobody will hear you. Because oh, they, have no, they have no yeah. words and to And they hear. call you they're... 20 years later and find out you wrote a paper 20 years ago. They finally <laughs> understand. I, I, knew, I knew when I went into this race in the 1980s, I knew I was in a marathon. And if I do anything constructively that pays off or, or the guys that I work with together create something amazing, whatever, if that would be the case, it would probably only be there 50 or 100 years after I'm dead. And I'm perfectly happy with that. Just being part of building this is what I get all my motivation from. Mm -hmm. um, you can never do spirituality as a sprint. Mm -hmm. It's a marathon. Yeah. But we need to bring religion for men and spirituality for women, as provocatively saying, into Western culture. We could not handle secularization. It ended up like Nietzsche said it would. It ended up with the death of God, the death of the God we had. It ended up in complete and total nihilism. And that total nihilism is obvious today. It's called the meaning crisis in our circles. If you go on the liminal web, it's called the meaning crisis or the meta crisis or whatever. It's obvious we're in the meaning crisis right now. We're in that state of nihilism. Digital has come along and it's an incredible tool for us to accumulate and spread knowledge to get a basis, what I call the sutra, what we need to create. But on top of that, we also need guys like you and me, and a lot of the guys probably following us here, who devote themselves to go down the spiritual path, either married like you did, or as a monk as I chose to do, go down the spiritual, mystical path and go deeper in the marathon race to create a religion for the Western culture that works. Mm -hmm. And there we can start from the Eastern traditions because they're ahead of us, 
They've gone through this before. They can explain why these things are happening. Yeah. And they're also developed along trade routes. They were not developed as tyrannies mm -hmm. to control the masses. They were developed by men along the trade routes who went to different spiritual schools along the trade routes to clean their heads from destructive thoughts, to go construct them a new, do great new deals in the next town they went into, right? These spiritual schools are the foundations of the cultural monasteries. The original monasteries were in Persia, they were called kastags. It's a beautiful word. Kastag later becomes cloister in Latin, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's another word for monastery. But the monasteries are these places we can go and clean our souls and purify ourselves and fix ourselves and go back into marriages and careers and everything we do in our lives with full motivation and knowing we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I have a curiosity. So you said that the holidays in Zoroastrianism are based around the equinoxes, the solstices. Makes perfect sense. These are This is the solar calendar, right? Yeah. And then... Do they have any other astrological significance to potentially the lunar calendar, the way that the moon cycles no. work? Astrology, that... astrology was Babylonian, not Persian. Mm -hmm. the Sor we don't have any recollection that Sorasses were doing astrology. Obviously, astrology was a precursor to astronomy. I mean, well, I you mean, lie there and look at the stars at night right. and imagine they meant something and you gave them stories. What Zoroastrianism says is that Zoroastrianism in itself is cleansed from that because Zoroastrianism is philosophy as religion practiced by you. It's like a, you go to spiritual school and you want to clarify your mind, you know. But Zoroastrianism does not have a problem with the fact that people have all kinds of religious ideas and worship all kinds of gods. Actually, the universal human rights were invented by Cyrus the Great. The Cyrus Cylinder is the only thing you find when you walk into the United Nations building in New York, because the only symbol of universal human rights tied to peace is the Cyrus Cylinder. It's the guy who doesn't kill the enemy. It's the guy who invites the enemy to become one with him and create an empire together. Mm -hmm. Kingdom. Kingdom. That's the guy. That's the origin of universal human rights. The origin of universal human rights is actually, it's, it's not like two opposing views. It's more like two levels of a society. What a society needs is it needs a leadership that agrees on a philosophy, often also agrees on a language. It's called a court religion or a court philosophy. This idea of Zoroastrianism. It is Zoroastrianism. This is philosophy. This religion is really hard to fathom, but and accept because you have to accept that you die one day and all that. But if you accept this, you can actually rule as a good ruler. And then you can allow people on the lower level to do whatever they like because that's a sutra. Mm -hmm. So Zoroastrianism in itself is a tantric religion. It doesn't have to be religion of the masses. Right. There are about three or four million followers we know today in the world. Probably like six or seven million in Iran have left Shia Islam and are eager to join. But we have a few million Zoroastrians in the world today and we're perfectly happy to be there as a salt in the earth or whatever you want to call it. Judaism is the sister religion, clearly. Mm -hmm. That love relationship started in Babylon long before we even defined Judaism. Yep. And they've influenced each other enormously. Yep. And they both have the Tantra and the Sutra separated, mm -hmm. which Christianity and Islam do not. And this is the argument in Protestant event is that we need to go back to Zoroastrianism and Judaism precisely because those are the two Western religions that practice the division between Tantra and Sutra. In Zoroastrianism, you even have your own religion for the priests, mm -hmm. a separate religion within the mysticism for the priests only. One of the things it's that I It's called Zurvanism, and it can never be written down. So let me so let me ask you this. One of the one of the criticisms I've had of the way that the Hindu caste system has been created is they're basically fixing people at certain castes and classes, and there's no mobility or evolution, which doesn't make any fucking sense to me. You know but, why it was created though? Why? It was the most successful peace organization ever. The reason why India has 1.4 billion people there, they had far less wars than everywhere else in the world. And that's that was the benefit of the caste system. But of course, the caste system was fixing something that should move. Again, I'm against Plato, I'm against Confucius, I'm against the caste system. What was liberating was that Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, and Taoism do not acknowledge the caste system. Mm -hmm. They deny it. Yep. We're all created equal in the sense that we should all have equal opportunities in life. This is why Buddhism and Zoroastrianism and Taoism also became popular along the trade routes because you completely ignore the caste system. Equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. Exactly. The equality of outcome game, that's Rousseau. <laughs> Stay out of the equality of outcome game. Yeah, that's, that's, that's where evil starts. It's a disaster. Starts. 
That's where disaster started. And it started long before Rousseau. It started Mastak. Mastak lived in the 6th century in the Sassanid Empire. And he was this guy who got so all the way the, to the top of the you said you said? Mazdak, M-A-Z-D-A-K. Yeah, but in the Seleucid Empire? Or? Sassanid Empire. Yeah, okay. The 6th century, before the plague hit them and then the Muslims invaded them. But the, 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 the uh, Mazdak was taken down by the Sorastan priest who they finally killed him because he was teaching that everybody should have equality of outcome in the entire Persian Empire. Mazdak was the hero of Muhammad and Mazdak was also the hero of Stalin. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to look at a shared heritage, common heritage with Stalinism and Islamism, it's actually Mostak, the Mostak character. And the Mostak character, of course, repeated with Jacobins and Greta Thunberg and Mao Zedong and all this shit today. The Protestants of history love Mostak. They love him because he, he, he said that we should give everybody equal amounts of absolutely everything. And that creates absolute madness. It's also against competition. It kills competition. Yeah. It kills all the best in men. It's a hatred of the phallus itself. And the irony of that is that they're saying everybody should be equal. And then in a quiet, demonic voice that if you have any ears at all, you can hear, it goes, everybody should be equal, except for me. Exactly. Except for <laughs> me, Stalin. Let's make a fucking million Stalin statues. The rest of us have to go to school. Make a million fucking Mao statues. Doesn't. Let's exactly. worship me. But everybody's equal. But everybody's equal. Everybody's equal. It's all beautiful. Except for me. Exactly. Is the demon that's fucking speaking One is more them. equal than the other equal. <laughs> yeah. We call this voice the anoject. And watch out. The anoject is the voice inside the lynch mob. Yeah. And while the lynch mob is running through the streets, well, culture is definitely the lynch mob. While the lynch mob is running down the streets, they all seem to agree that they share a conviction, like if there was a voice among them. And all it takes is for one guy to realize that there's an anoject within the lynch mob. There's an agreement that we all know. We all know that Jews are dirty. We all know that. Once one guy realizes that and puts on a uniform and gives voice to the anoject, you got fucking Adolf Hitler and things move very quickly from then on. Mm. The lynch mob is humanity at its worst. Sorastianism, Judaism, Buddhism and Taoism have all together fought against the lynch mob as idea. Yeah. And they've done their very, very best to eliminate it. What Zoroaster did radically 3,700 years ago was he banned the blood sacrifice. Mm -hmm. This is why across the Persian Empire, you could not sacrifice animals anywhere. And you could certainly not sacrifice humans, which is what you do once you sacrifice animals. Once you go from the hunter mode to the warrior mode, you start sacrificing humans. Mm. He stopped it. He said, there is nobody listening to the blood sacrifice. There is nothing there. Stop it. And instead he said, just keep the fire itself. So the sacrificial fire burns with woods. And that is the Sorastan fire temple. So the fire temple replaced blood sacrifice. It was one way of getting rid of the lynch mob because the lynch mob runs down the street to find its victim and then sacrifice the victim. And that's blood sacrifice. And also it's, a, it's psychologically, it's the scapegoat mentality, which is exactly. like, we need to purify ourselves. And in order to purify ourselves, let's project all of our evil onto the scapegoat, which yes. could be an actual goat, yep. or it could be a class of people. It could be the Jews. It could be whoever else. It, it can might be, be anybody. It could be anybody. Yeah. You scapegoat yeah. these people. And then Usually an at, that person, point, it, yeah. at that point, it gives you all of the rights to sacrifice them. Yeah. in whatever way you want to sacrifice. And in this way, René Girard is absolutely right. He's the last major Christian thinker I think we have in the West, Catholic, he died a few years ago. Peter Thiel's favorite, you know. René Girard says that getting rid of Christianity was a terrible idea because the secularized society we get after Christianity is gone will bring back the lynch mob and blood sacrifice. And that's exactly what we see in media today. That's exactly what we see in academia today. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what cancel culture is. These forces are incredibly evil, right? And the fact that you can have the boss of the University of Pennsylvania sit in Congress and say she's perfectly okay, there are students are hating Jews in 2023 means that this is what happens in a secular America. Don't get rid of Christianity too quickly. Rather understand that secularization is a necessary move before you actually pursue an honest spirituality that you can believe in. But once you go over to the Eastern religions, you will find your home. 
But that journey out of Christianity, if you go too quickly, like we did in Scandinavia, Christianity is dead and over. We created, we invented woke. <laughs> there's, mm. there's no coincidence Greta Thunberg comes from Sweden. I'm not proud of it, but it's the honest thing that happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm fighting against it now with Eastern spirituality. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that you see these kind of heroic figures arise. And I look at Elon Musk and I say, uh-huh, that's an Ashavan. You know, that's someone who's willing to stand it's for called, the It's called it's willing to stand for the good in, in Hebrew religion, Messiah. Uh -huh. It's called Saushiant in Persian. So the original term is Saushiant. The Saushiant is somebody personifies what saves us from going down. So it's a guy or a function, rather, that steps into culture when culture is in decline and says, we can be saved from the decline. We still have the time to do it. Uh, I'd say Elon Musk perfectly does it as the chief because he's an engineer, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever he steps into the priest mode, he's terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> right. The way you describe it is I said, I'm sorry, Elon Musk is terrible at social. He's terrible at social. He and Twitter is a loss-making thing for him, although he can speak freely. But, you know, when it comes to, you know, uh, SpaceX and Tesla, he rocks. Yeah. <laughs> so he needs a priest, I think, to accompany him in being the chief. And he would be a much better team. He's a bit lonely doing the chief thing. He's a yeah. bit of a sort of industrial tyrant at the moment. If there would be a team around Elon, it could be absolutely awesome. I think Peter Thiel is the guy who realizes this, is trying to look for both. And maybe he's actually geared more to much priest mode than chief mode. I don't know. I don't mm. know these guys yet, but you know they are the heroes of our time because they, they 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 build big tech and big tech is killing all the industry. We need guys now to step in and do the same revolution with politics, and we need guys to step in and do the same revolution with academia. Personally, I think academia is over. I think Harvard and Stanford even will be closed within ten years. Certainly, Bowling Green goes out the door now. I think kids today are arriving at this. I work with some fantastic people in America called the Fifteen Seventeen Fund. They Took, taking in billions of dollars to spend them on taking kids out of college and give them money to start companies. These are the kind of ideas I love in America at the moment. Mm -hmm. More entrepreneurship, more competition, mm -hmm. more of the things that you and I love. There should be more of that in America. And um, so these are the good things happening at the moment, but we have to look at the chief and the, and the priest aspect. And the priest aspect, what you and I stand for, in the sense that we said, we also have to become spiritual men and not only entrepreneurial and, and compete you know, in, in the marketplace with new products and things, but we also have to be these guys who go the spiritual path. Yeah, that's part of what's being balanced. It's, yes. it's the warrior. I think it's, Elon agrees. I don't think just, it's just that he doesn't have that team around him He doesn't him yet. have that access. And that's why he did a fuck up when he took over Twitter. He should have had a priestly team with him before he did that. Well, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with what he did. With, I'm, I'm happy with still X. with it. I think it was great. I, I love, I think I mean, at X least, at least, at least people, yeah. at least people can share their ideas. But if freely. you look at the numbers, it doesn't look very good. Maybe it'll be a turnaround eventually. I think or he passes it on to somebody who's more responsible to take on the priestly role. He is the perfect chief. Mm -hmm. He's kingly. He has a king quality. And that's what great entrepreneurs have. Yeah. And we love him for it. Bard. Yes. This is awesome, man. Marcus. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome being here in Austin, Texas, finally. <laughs> I know. Corona's over. I can travel again. I travel <laughs> around the world with my team. We have a wonderful time. I love my monks. Uh, I just live the happiest lives ever. And you look good. <laughs> Thank you, man. You look good, too. You look really good. It's been a pleasure being here. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure as well. Yep. Uh, I ordered your book, but I didn't get it quite yet. So I haven't read it, but I'm looking okay, process, I'm process an event. We'll see if I have a call. The book is called Process an Event. I don't do sales pitches, but it's a book out there. And if you're a great fan of Auburn Me, you can also try to contact me on social media. I actually happily gift the book to people who are serious students, yeah. who are serious policy students. I like to do that, but it's out there. You can find it on Amazon in America, Prost Event yeah. by Bard and Soderquist. And it's our major metaphysical statement. We've yeah. done metaphysics properly from the very bottom up, and we love being philosophers. Yeah. Well, it's beautiful to know you, brother. Let's go. Oh, night too. And let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. We love you guys. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere. And leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.